Hello and welcome to Shropshire Museum's Collection Centre. Today we're in the Geology Store taking a look at some of the 45,000 rocks, fossils and minerals that we have in the collection. The geology of Shropshire covers 11 out of 13 of the geological time periods, so is a wealth of information about Britain's geological past. Part of this story is a story of uh, extinctions, and that's what we'll be looking at particular in this film, using both the geology collection and some of our natural history specimens with Sue Rees Evans, a local ecologist. Okay, so what exactly is extinction? Well, species are described as extinct when there are basically no living members of those species left. But of course, this can happen at a range of levels. At one extreme, you could have perhaps a single species that becomes extinct just in a specific local geographic area. We would say that's locally extinct. And at the other end of the scale, of course, we can have numerous species becoming extinct or at or around the same time on a global scale. And then, of course, those species can't be found anywhere on the Earth. And it's actually nice to be talking about extinction now as part of the Darwin Film Festival, because, of course, Charles Darwin, very famous for his theory of evolution by natural selection. But those principles that underlie natural selection are the same ones that also help explain extinction. So natural selection, we think about certain individuals being better suited, better adapted to environments. And those things that make them better suited, make them better able to compete for food and all sorts of other resources. So they go on, as is well documented, thrive and survive and reproduce and evolve in all sorts of wonderful ways. But there's obviously a flip side to that coin. And so those less well adapted species won't thrive in the same way, won't be able to compete for those resources. And so they naturally decline and ultimately become extinct and die out. So it's really uh, the natural selection principles that not only explain how new species come along, but also how older species eventually ultimately die out. Yes, and we all think of Darwin as being a kind of a naturalist looking at plants and animals that were around at the time that he was. But he started out as a geologist, didn't he? Yeah. And in fact, um, I had a look in our accession register, which is the book that records everything that was given to the early museum. And there's a lovely entry here from the 1840s that talk about Darwin donating papers from his most recent geological writings to the early museum to be shared with other scientists in the town. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. And of course, um, we're talking some time ago in Darwin's heyday, but uh, in recent times now, when we bring up subjects like certainly extinction, it has such a a negative connotation, understandably, and is very much associated with the catastrophic impact that our species has had on other species. But if we take a step back and look uh, back through geological time, as Darwin and many others did, we can see there's evidence that extinction has been around since life on Earth has been around. Indeed, always there present at some level. So you've mentioned that extinction happens on kind of different scales. Um, should we start by looking at kind of mass extinctions and the more catastrophic events? Yeah, so uh, mass extinction, it refers to a major catastrophic global event, which is a fairly sizable words in themselves. Um, and these events basically cause the huge levels of extinction of huge numbers of different species on a global scale. And when we talk about major events, we're really talking about things like meteorite impact with the Earth. We're talking perhaps about um, huge tectonic plate movements in the Earth's crust, which have associated huge levels of volcanic activity. Um, and as has been well documented, of course, huge amounts of volcanic activity lead ultimately with the dust and the gases to climate change and also alterations in the sea levels. So you're talking at this grand scale, really, of these uh, major events. And when we talk about mass extinctions, probably the most famous of these 
uh, is the one that happened at the end of what we call the Cretaceous period, which was around 65 million years ago. Very hard to visualize that. But it was an event caused by a meteorite impact with the Earth and also a huge amount of volcanic activity going on at the same time. And this led to huge extinction levels. They estimate around 62% of species were lost. And of course, the reason most of us will be aware of this one is because those big and wonderful creatures that roamed the land, the dinosaurs, were lost and became extinct at that time. But as well as it having a huge effect on animals on the land, it obviously affected the oceans as well. And there was greater levels of extinction in the oceans. Up to 70%, they think, of marine animal species alone were lost at this time. And that included uh, wonderful things like the enormous plesiosaurs that used to glide through the oceans, mosasaurs with those huge jaws, and animals like we have here, this wonderful ammonite. So this is an amazing specimen and it took a lot of effort to get it off, down off the shelves, in fact. Um, so tell us something about ammonites. Yeah, well, as you say, a truly uh, wonderful looking creature. And ammonites are what we call uh, ancient marine cephalopods, which sounds exciting. But basically their closest living relatives are animals like squid and cuttlefish. And ammonites came in all sizes. This is a fairly impressive example, but many of us will have been uh, fossiling in various Jurassic coastal beaches, not in Shropshire with no beaches, but you'll have found little tiny ones as well. So they came in a huge range of sizes. And essentially, as is often the case with fossils, we have the hard outer shell of the ammonite preserved here. And if we had the whole animal, we would in fact see the soft bodied parts reaching out here at the mouth end of the shell with tentacles reaching out uh, into the ocean here. So ammonites were really marine predators. They were moving around in the Jurassic Ocean. So the same time as our dinosaurs were roaming the land, these predators were one of many in the sea. And they were really clever. They would grow by laying down these shells and they would lay them down one chamber at a time. And you'll be able to see, even on the film here, the lines uh, separating the different chambers that make up the ammonite shell. And what was the clever bit was the ammonite could then control the amount of water and gas within those chambers. And by doing so, you would then control its buoyancy and its position in the water column. So that was one way the ammonite could drive itself, if you like, around the ocean. And the other way was very similar to our modern relatives, the squid and the cuttlefish. They would very rapidly push their tentacles together at the mouth end, and this would force them in a type of jet propulsion to move very rapidly sideways through the water column. So well adapted for seeking out all sorts of smaller uh, marine animals for their prey. So these disappeared at the same time as the dinosaurs? They did. They disappeared in the same mass extinction as the dinosaurs. And as I said before, when we think about mass extinctions, we often think of that one where we lost the dinosaurs. But in truth, there have been many mass extinctions over geological time. But five of them really stand out because five were huge, so they are known appropriately as the Big Five. And this extinction at the end of the Cretaceous was one of the Big Five, but not the biggest. And that actually came many millions of years before, 248 million years before, to be precise, at the end of a period of time called the Permian. Okay, a huge mass extinction event where they estimate that over 95% of animals in the oceans were lost at that time, which is just too much really to comprehend. Scientists uh, argue a lot about what exactly caused this mass extinction, but it seems to be a number of factors contributed. There was apparently a very low concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere. There again was a lot of volcanic activity as we had with uh, the mass extinction when we lost the dinosaurs. The sea level has been recorded to have been dramatically low, which obviously would have affected many species too. And uh, perhaps the most fascinating thing is that it was at this time that 
Pangaea, this big mass of land came together with plate movements to form this single mass of land we call Pangaea. And because that happened, the ocean currents moving around the Earth would have been affected and would have been changed. So again, yet another feature that would have contributed to uh, the mass extinction. And many, many things were lost, understandably, in this. And one of the interesting things that were lost were animals like the trilobites we can see here. So we've got quite a nice collection of trilobites um, in the geology store here. Uh, can you tell us just exactly what a trilobite was? Well, trilobites were some of the earliest marine arthropods. So when we're talking about arthropods, we're talking about animals with uh, jointed appendages. And of course, we have many arthropods, the most dominant uh, landform on the planet nowadays, including insects uh, and, and many other uh, invertebrates. But these were some of the earliest arthropods, as I say. And we have some lovely examples here from Shropshire. Um, they became extinct, as we said, in the end of Permian mass extinction. But their heyday was really many years before that, many millions of years, in what we call the uh, Cambrian, the Ordovician and the Silurian geological periods. And here in Shropshire, and particularly in South Shropshire, we're very lucky because a lot of the rock strata we have exposed are Ordovician and Silurian rocks. And as a result, we have these beautiful uh, examples and indeed many more in our stores here uh, down in Ludlow. And when we look at a trilobite, um, we can see really, if we look reasonably close up, that they all have a similar body pattern. And their exoskeleton, that outer protective covering, is split clearly into these three areas, three lobes. And that, of course, is how they get their name, trilobite, three lobes to the structure of the body. And trilobites were many and varied. They existed and they thrived, as I say, had their heyday for many millions of years. And as a result, many, many different types evolved. They would come in different sizes. They could be less than a millimetre in length. They could be the sort of what you might call acceptable, sensible size, like these examples here. Or they could get as enormous, almost really, as the ammonite, being up to 70 centimetres in length, which really would have been quite spectacular to see. And they evolved in all sorts of different ways. As the pressures on their lives in the oceans changed and predators increased, they developed increasing amounts of spines to protect themselves, and indeed their sight was really spectacular. And trilobites are the first animals known to have had what we call compound eyes. Um, I mentioned the insects before being modern arthropods, but the trilobites had the first compound eyes that we know of in the fossil record. A compound eye being uh, capable of seeing a really quite exacting picture because it uses many, many different lenses to form that image. So spectacular creatures, and they even developed uh, some beautiful ways of avoiding predators. I've got two lovely examples here. And you can see that they've actually rolled up, not unlike uh, wood lice that we see uh, in our gardens these days, rolling themselves up, developing that behavior. So again, they could protect themselves from increasing levels of predation uh, in those oceans. So those are some really nice examples of kind of mass extinction. Um, but a lot of the time we think of extinction as being a kind of a one species loss in perhaps just one part of the world. And I brought along this passenger pigeon that was on display at Shrewsbury Museum because that's a really nice example of this kind of one species disappearing. The passenger pigeon was native to North America and it was a migratory bird that moved from the south up to the north, um, following the seasons, looking for food and shelter and places to nest. They traveled in huge flocks. Um, and in the 1870s, people talked about seeing clouds of these birds blackening the sky. Mm. Um, and then they suddenly disappear by the 1890s.
um, people saw these huge flocks as being a real risk to agriculture and that they would come down and completely decimate fields. Mm. So there was a real push towards hunting them and they were being shot for their feathers, for their meat and just to reduce the population numbers. Mm. Unfortunately, this happened to such an extent um, that by the 1890s they were very rarely seen and the last one to live in captivity died in 1901. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of talk recently about why that extinction happened and were there other contributing factors and some archaeologists have suggested that um, the genocide of North uh, American Indians may have had something to do with it that Traditionally, they hunted these birds and that as their numbers were decimated, there was a huge population boom that the environment couldn't support and then their numbers were crashing anyway. Um, but that shows how for each of these species, they're so interwoven with the rest of their Absolutely. environment that as that changes, then their numbers will change as well. Yeah. So our passenger pigeon was an example of how extinction can happen for a sudden event. Uh, is there ever cases where extinction happens normally? Well, as I said at the start of the film, uh, extinction has occurred at some level ever since the beginning of life on Earth. So there's always been a, a background rate, if you like, of extinction of species just as uh, we explained that Darwin's theories of uh, evolution through natural selection helped explain speciation, how new species arrived, they also explain why uh, species become less suitable for an environment and ultimately die out and become extinct. So yes, there is a, a background natural turnover of species that will autom not automatically, but will eventually become extinct. Yes, and I imagine the Shropshire Mammoth is an example of that, where a changing climate was uh, a significant factor in its disappearance. Absolutely, and uh, as uh, early man was just really starting to appear on the scene and certainly played his part, we believe, in the extinction ultimately of mammoths, they were very much in decline due to a natural climate change that was ensuing the end of the last ice age. And it's lovely to talk about uh, mammoths because of course we have the lovely Shropshire mammoths uh, which were found here back in 1986. Okay, so round here we are incredibly fortunate to have the remains of the Shropshire mammoths. And these, as I say, were discovered in 1986 in Condover Quarry, which is just south of Shrewsbury itself. And what they found were the remains of one adult male and a number of juvenile mammoth skeletons as well. And sadly, we don't have time to dive into all the cupboards, but we do have time to look in just one here. So we'll see what we get. And inside this cupboard, I'm hoping to give you a really good idea of the size of these mammoths. So if I pull out just this bone here, it's always a lovely one to show to visiting children. Uh, and when I ask them, they're convinced it's the bone of a trunk, particularly if I hold it like this. But it is, in fact, a rib. And if we imagine, compared to the size of my ribs, how big these animals must have been, breathing in with huge lungs and out again as they went across feeding on those bits of vegetation. So really massive, massive animals. And so we're very lucky to have these remains here. The adult male stood three meters, 20 centimeters tall to the shoulder. Okay, so that is huge. It's far higher than this ceiling above my head. Almost too huge to imagine. And of course the adult male they've estimated was 28 years old so he wasn't apparently fully grown either. So they would have got far larger than that. And of course been covered in wonderful uh, woolly hair as well. Now we believe these mammoths were some of the last remaining mammoths found in Northern Europe. And it's estimated that they died out 12,800 years ago. And with the research that's been done on these remains, 
we believe that they met their end in a kettle hole. Now, when the ice was retreating at the end of the last ice age, various chunks of ice, if you like, were left embedded in the ground. And so these would remain frozen for a little longer and then melt at a later date. And of course, when they melted, they left these steep-sided kettle holes, which became full of water, sludge, mud, all sorts of things. And unfortunately, it would appear mammoths. So we believe they would have come along probably independently, and perhaps having a drink, but for whatever reason, fell into the kettle hole and were unable, sadly, to get out. And that's why we find their remains preserved at the bottom of it. So quite a precise ending, we think we know, for these mammoths. But in more general terms, they simply died out, we believe, with a combination of the warming climate being far less appropriate for the species. And we've talked many times now about how animals become less suitable, certainly often to an environment that's changing. And these were adapted for cold weather. They had this wonderful woolly coat. And of course, in the warmer climate, that just made life really difficult and arduous. And when you couple that with the ever-growing presence of early man, hunting on an increasing level, we have the perfect recipe, sadly, for the end of the mammoths. So it seems to be that extinction is caused by a complex mix of factors in most cases. Absolutely. It's, uh, it, nothing is very easy to pigeonhole, as we say, uh, in all things biological. And it's usually always the case that it's a combination of factors or pressures on a species that ultimately leads to its extinction. And I mean, what we've seen in this film to date is really that extinction exists on a, a continuous spectrum, if you like, with at one end this sort of background tick over, this background rate of species naturally becoming extinct, and at the other end, these huge mass extinction events that we talked about when we uh, lost the trilobites or the ammonites and dinosaurs and things like this. So where do you think we are now on that kind of extinction spectrum? Well, uh, the sad and rather frightening truth is we are uh, on the brink of or in a, a massive biodiversity crisis to the extent that many people are calling it now the sixth mass extinction. And from the little we've talked about mass extinctions, that's quite a statement to make. And the reason for these uh, statements are that we are seeing background extinction rates now are operating at a rate hundreds of times faster than we have ever seen in the evidence from the fossil record. Um, and if we even start to home in on particular groups of species, there was an Australian entomologist who put out a report just in 2019, Francisco Sanchez Bio, and he was looking at all the gathered evidence for declines in insects. And he basically estimated that we're on the verge of losing about 41% of insect species. And of course, when we talk about losing species, certainly things like insects, the smaller uh, animals that we have, many of these species haven't yet even been discovered. So they're things we don't even know about. Um, and he also concluded with the frightening words again that we are witnessing the largest extinction event since that scene at the end of the Permian. So again, really powerful words uh, for really quite dramatic times that we are in. And uh, this has come about largely for a whole host of reasons. I mean, thinking about insects again, the impact of habitat loss, the impact of continual use of pesticides, um, all sorts of factors coming into play, the impact of climate change itself, all fueled by increased uh, human activity for more and more and more, and making uh, the climate change situation uh, worse, continuing. And this is what we're seeing uh, in, in this period of time that we're in now. And as I say, it's very real, and it's not just uh, something we talk about that maybe we're losing species over in the Amazon or in far-flung places that many of us, sadly, will never get to. But we see these impacts even here, on our doorsteps, in our gardens in Shropshire, and in our wider countryside here in Shropshire. So have you got some examples that you could tell us about species loss actually here in Shropshire? 
Absolutely, and even just a sort of background anecdotes. Um, in one of my other uh, hats, if you like, that I wear in Shropshire, I'm what they call the uh, Dragonfly County Recorder. And uh, clearly I have quite an interest in insects, but this role involves um, when people go out and make species records, biological records of dragon and damselflies, those records filter through to me and I check them and collate them and basically see what's in the county and looking out for changes. And a good number of people who go out and make these dragon and damselfly records have said over recent years that they're just not finding the numbers, they're not finding the abundance of uh, individuals out there. And certainly I remember going to some sites, uh, riverside meadows, where you'd be walking through the grasses, clouds of damselflies everywhere. And quite often I'll take groups on courses now and we'll be struggling to find two or three examples of different species. The species are there, but the abundance, the numbers are largely going down in a lot of cases. And this very much uh, puts them under threat in itself. But we've also got some uh, other species that sadly we have lost from uh, Shropshire, which are beautifully illustrated in some of these collections, uh, John Norton's collections of butterflies that we have here at the museum. And the one I'm going to start with is this beautiful blue butterfly here, the large blue. Okay, and this actually became extinct in the UK in 1979. Um, and there are actually reintroduction programs underway and they've tried and quite successfully reintroduced it to parts of uh, the southwest of the UK. But it's not back in Shropshire and there are historic records that it used to fly here. It's a fascinating insect. It has an incredibly uh, complex lifestyle in that the eggs hatch out into caterpillars, which of course we all know about, but these caterpillars are then taken down underground into the nests of red ants, and only a particular type of red ant. And then down in that nest, they're not attacked, they're nurtured if you like, and then they pupate, and then the adult will come out and emerge successfully uh, from the ant nest to start life in the adult form. But when they found that this species was dying out, they also found that the red ant that is involved in this strange life cycle was also missing. And it's become really quite a complex process to uh, create suitable habitat, not only to get the butterfly back, but to get this particular red ant back so the butterfly can complete its life cycle. And it all comes down to essentially sward length, the length of vegetation and how much that warms the ground underneath because that has to be right for the ant to live there and that has to live there for the butterfly to live there. So um, even though we're talking about local extinction, it's a really good example of how these species, both plant and animal, are also closely interwoven. And two other examples of species that used to fly uh, in Shropshire but don't any longer and indeed don't in the UK are this uh, lovely black veined white. If you can just see on the bottom this image here, really quite a showy, beautiful butterfly. Clearly, uh, obviously got its common name there because of those very distinctive black veins on the white wings. And the last one, just to mention, because it's another excuse to look at some lovely specimens, uh, are these large tortoiseshell butterflies. Again, now extinct. They were recorded in Shropshire, but not found locally and indeed not found anywhere in the UK. Um, so sad examples really of things that are no longer flying, but it does underline the importance as we are here in the stores of having specimens and biological records so we can see what used to actually be here because human beings are always in great danger of uh, accepting what we see now as the norm. Um, and even when we talk about uh, abundance of insects, I was talking about dragon uh, and damselflies earlier, but even if you don't know what species of insect you're dealing with, we will probably, certainly most of us here, remember driving through country lanes in summer and having huge numbers of insects, unfortunately meeting their grisly end on the windscreens or the lights of cars to the extent that you had to clear them off. And I actually can't uh, remember 
doing that in recent times. So even if you know nothing about insects, we can see how much the abundance of these animals has decreased. There's one other uh, insect I'd like to share with you because I have a strong bias to dragon and damselflies and that's just behind uh, you actually, <laughs> Emma Kate. If you're happy to indicate the one in the top right hand corner. And this is a uh, local species called the white-faced darter, a dragonfly species that we are still lucky enough to have here in Shropshire. But we've only got it in northern Shropshire on an area called Wixall Moss. And that's because it's a habitat specialist. It likes uh, boggy pools full of sphagnum. Um, and this is a species that used to be at other sites, certainly in England, but in the last 50 years it has been lost from 50% of those sites. So this is very much a local speciality. Um, the closest area to us that also has this species is Chartley Moss in Staffordshire and then there's two sites where they've reintroduced it I think currently in the Lake District but really the only remaining stronghold after that is up in northwest Scotland. And this species has declined for a host of reasons, not least uh, drainage of its habitat and turning that into agricultural land, but also because of climate change. And this is a species that actually uh, sits in the UK at the bottom of its uh, range that it's happy in. It's a colder species. So as we warm up, Whereas we're bringing in some new species from Europe as we get warmer, we're also pushing out other species typically up to the northwestern regions before ultimately, sadly, one has to assume uh, we may well lose them. And indeed, specimens like this uh, white-faced data in the case there may be uh, one of the last few left in Shropshire, um, but we'll have to see what happens. So I think one thing that's been clear as we've been discussing is that people seem to have been a huge factor, certainly in modern times with extinctions. Um, is there anything that we can do to kind of address the balance to be part of the solution as well as part of the problem? Absolutely. I mean, it obviously feels overwhelming uh, when you're faced with the sorts of things we've been talking about, these kind of massive global declines in levels of species. But there's always something you can do on the home front and every contribution helps. So at one end of the scale, whilst we need huge changes in landscape use and agricultural policies and all sorts of political arenas, we can also help. And certainly uh, coming back uh, with my bias towards insects, there are things we can do to help in our own gardens. Many of us are blessed with our own gardens. And even if we're not, we can have window boxes which we can plant up with plants that are useful for pollinators, providing them uh, with food for as much of the year as possible. In uh, lockdown uh, last year, we're still in it, <laughs> last year I actually uh, deliberately didn't mow the lawn and it was fabulous. I would come back, we had this area of front lawn as well, so we were very public with this and we just let it grow. I didn't do anything complicated or plant seeds or really manage it, we just let it go and it was fabulous. It was full of butterflies, beetles, I would come back and hear crickets and this is all in the middle of town. Uh, in Shrewsbury itself. So even those little things, it's about letting the wildlife take over really again in corners of your garden and it really has an effect. We have our own pond and it's remarkably exciting how everything becomes when it's in your pond as opposed to somewhere else. So I would encourage anyone to build a pond and even in a tiny garden. I have people send in records of damselflies, for example, that have emerged from tiny uh, sort of bowl ponds or ponds made out of old plant pots and things. So they really can make use of whatever's available. Leaving corners wild, leaving log piles, all these sorts of things. Just thinking really about how we can live with and alongside wildlife rather than constantly being focused on our activities and doing things at the expense of wildlife. I think that alone will make a, a huge difference. And if we all used our gardens in that way with wildlife in mind, there would be the most fabulous network of species supporting habitat as opposed to having immaculate, lifeless lawns as we see so often, or worse still, astroturf.